Welcome to the podcast on how to de-risk business adoption of AI. Today's topic is extremely timely and very uh, complex uh, on how do we secure generative AI. I'm here talking to Steve Wilson. You already know Steve, but a couple of lines on who he is from my perspective. Steve is Steve Wilson is Chief Product Officer at Exabeam and is one of the um, industry's foremost publication on the top 10 list uh, for um, large language model applications security checklist from OASP. And so he is one of the primary um, you know, authors and uh, leaders for that effort which is truly a um, phenomenal effort. So I'm really um, would like to appreciate that as well as thank you personally for that, Steve. Well, thanks, Pamela. Thanks for having me on. Yes, absolutely. It's my pleasure and honor. Steve, what did I leave out in your intro? Um, You know, again, Chief Product Officer at Exabeam, um, project lead at OWASP around large language models. Um, The other thing worth mentioning is that uh, I've just wrapped up writing a new book for O'Reilly Media. It's called The Developer's Playbook for Large Language Model Security, and that will be out in September this year. Wow. I, I'm waiting to uh, see that. Can't wait to put my hands on it and um, get a autograph version of that. Steve. <laughs> Great. It is, again, very timely, and we do need a lot of guidance um, around this. So really uh, glad to see that you've published a book. Um, and that I think that's a good segue into my first question, which is, what is the state of generative AI security and is the security community prepared in your perspective? Um, I think it's it's really interesting journey that we've been on. If we go back to last spring and summer when we put together this OWASP group, the the genesis of it was that there was virtually no coherent guidance on what security meant for generative AI. The, you know, well, well, generative AI and transformers had been around for a few years pre chat GPT. It just wasn't something people thought about. And um, so last spring and summer, the, the world was very unprepared. People were rushing to put these things into production. And we we saw a lot of people embarrass themselves, you know, whether it was a Chevy dealer selling cars for a dollar or even these companies like Microsoft and Google putting out generative AI applications that that went awry. Um, I think the good news is that with a lot of the work that's been done, I think we've we've been through these cycles before and the security industry has definitely jumped at the idea that Gen AI is important, that it needs unique security. Um, We've seen big players and small players alike who are jumping into the space to help, as well as um, these organizations like OWASP and now MITRE and NIST coming in and trying to provide good guidance. So I think it's it's a rapidly evolving area, but the industry is taking it seriously. And um, that that means we have a chance at getting it right this time. Do you think we have the time um, from a perspective of, you know, implementing, adopting, and um, being able to figure out what that guidance is and make sense out of it, be, make it actionable. In other words, we are already creating initiatives. We are rolling them out. To your point earlier, you know, you saw some, you know, we saw some embarrassing um, snafus that, came out with along with you know rolling these systems out how how uh, closely uh, aligned do you think are the security requirements for generative ai with let's say predictive ai or non ai systems yeah so you know coming at this from a couple different perspectives you know one was looking at it through the owasp lens which is all around talking about the risks, these are all the things that can go wrong, right? It, it can put you in this sense of 
wow, this is re- this is really dangerous. How could I possibly do this right? On the other hand, when when I come at this from the perspective of my day job at Exabeam, we launched Exabeam Copilot this year. We built a large language model into our platform. It's been the fastest adopted feature that we've ever had, and we're getting great reviews from our customers. But we did that in an informed way around what were the pitfalls We put some very um, specific limiters around what it could and couldn't do. And so I I think the fact of the matter is from an industry perspective, if we go into this well-informed about what the risks are and go into it taking advantage of some of the design patterns that are out there, you can do things that are secure, that are very high value. And what we want to do is, is raise that bar of what's reasonable and safe to do with these large language models over time as we better understand them and better get that security infrastructure in place. Um, do, you, do, um, do you go into that into the book um, that you co-authored? Ab- Absolutely. And I think for... For people who have read the top 10 list, and you know that's hundreds of thousands of people at this point, um, the great thing about the list is it's, it's easy to digest. People walk away knowing a handful of things that can go wrong, and they start to build a mental model about it. But, um, but really, in terms of remediations, what you get out of the top 10 list is a few bullets that you need to go research yourself and think about how you're going to approach. The advantage of a longer form version of this, um, like, like the book, which is, you know, 10 times longer than the, the top 10 list document is that it's not just a list of vulnerabilities. Um, although we do go into some of the top vulnerabilities and how they work and what that mental model is, uh, really the, the second half of the book is around what do secure architectures look like for this? How do I add, um, very specific specific elements to say my DevOps, you know, or my DevSecOps lifecycle when I'm adding a large language model, what do I need to add to that DevSecOps lifecycle? What do I need to do with monitoring and response when I'm adding LLM? So I think there are actually a lot of really great best practices that are developing. And and we spend a lot of time on that in the book in terms of giving you frameworks and checklists for how do you do, how do you do a good job? Not just what are all the pitfalls? Okay, th- that's important, uh, mm-hmm. certainly. I think both of them are important to know what can go wrong and how to um, put in the right right people, process, as well as uh, procedures, methodologies around that, right? Yeah. Um, so large language models, uh, they do face unique and serious issues, which we have not seen in the past, right? One, uh, for example, uh, even in, in the, you know in the OASP um, guidance, and if you haven't seen that, I do encourage you to go look at that as well for the audience. That the one of the major differences is that the control and data planes cannot be strictly isolated or separate separated out, right? So there are unique inst- you know uh, problems that we are going to have to be aware of. To your point earlier, and be prepared to kind of deal with it at various levels in that development process, whether it's the developers, whether it's the data engineers, right? Whether it's the um, the pro- program managers who can be aware of, you know, what what um, roadblocks to expect, you know, yeah. that may not follow uh, traditional. Um, is there anything that um, you know kind of jumps out as you know there are unique things that are definitely going to be different that um, the whoever is adopting it, let's say a public model, uh, these are things that they definitely should be prepared for. Uh, is there a kind of a, a cookie cutter? template one can adopt you know if you're doing public models this is these are things you definitely must be looking for Mm -hmm. yeah so you you started off by by bringing up that interesting distinction here that that llms by their nature when you prompt them that prompt might be full of things that are instructions and data and it's and it's all mixed together and um 
you know, when you look at, at prompt injection as a vulnerability, that, that name, when it got developed, was designed to evoke things like SQL injection from a, you know, yeah. security point of view. Um, and, and that is where, you know, SQL injection, it's like, well, if I'm mixing some instructions into my query, I can, I can get in trouble, right? Where I've taken in some untrusted data and put it with something I'm supposed to trust and put it near something sensitive. But ultimately, the, the interfaces into your SQL database are very specific. There are ways to use it that are 100% safe. They're well understood. And you can use you know, simple static analysis tools to find where that goes wrong. You can't do that with a large language model for something like prompt injection. And um, there are great tools cropping up. I, I broadly call these guardrails frameworks. And there are open source ones, commercial ones. There's a lot out there that you can go research that you should be putting in place that will help screen out a lot of those possible, say, prompt injection scenarios. But I think you need to think about prompt injection actually less like SQL injection than you do like phishing. Um, because there are no durable, 100% foolproof known remedies to it. And so, you know, with phishing, today we have all these great email filters that help screen out 99% of those cases. And none of us would survive if those weren't there. But we all still have to know that we're going to get a certain percentage of those phishing things. And so any CISO is also putting in place other defenses and doing training and adding other tools to, to deal with things like phishing. And I think what that means is knowing that there are a handful of these vulnerabilities, whether it's phishing or supply chain attacks that are, that are real threats that we don't have complete mitigations to. You have to treat your large language model inside your app as something somewhere in between a confused deputy and an enemy sleeper agent. You need to wrap zero trust boundaries around it, and the LLM is not a trusted element of your app. So going back to your question about, you know, are there um, good architectural guidelines? There really are, and part of it is taking a real zero trust approach to what do you let in and out of that LLM, and where do you let that output go, and how much do you trust it? Um, there are also really good patterns around how you you get data into the LLM and how you interact with it. And, you know, traditional machine learning, everything about getting data into your model is about how you train it. Uh, I think what we see today with LLMs is most apps do no training. Uh, they take a pre-trained transformer, right? That's the, you know, P, T, and chat GPT. Um, it already knows a lot of facts and it knows how to speak English and Japanese and Swahili. Um, so it's got a lot of capabilities, but then you don't necessarily fine tune it to your, um, to your use case. You do things like prompt engineering and retrieval augmented generation or RAG for short. And those are patterns that actually in a lot of ways can provide you tremendous amounts of advantages in terms of kind of accuracy and security of what goes on inside that model and how it handles data. And so looking at those architectures around, say, zero trust and RAG and and looking at best practice patterns for those, um, huge advantages for people. OK, well, uh, so you said quite a few things. I'll just unpack a little of a couple of them. One is SQL injection prompt injection, even though they sound similar, but the remedies and the mitigation for them are completely different just because we are dealing with parameterized uh, input for SQL injection, for example. And in case of LLMs, we're talking about, you know, natural language, right? The, the attack surface or the, the uh, possible inputs are is is infinite so it's really not going to work in terms of um, looking for a particular attack pattern right, right. Um, and, and that's very um, uh, helpful and you know reiterates that point that because we were able to put in security controls in the past um, that may not work and I think those who are adopting it it's really important to kind of um, 
communicate that through the various um, parts of the business that are looking to get value out of um, generative models, right? And we haven't even looked at the multimodal um, testing tools, which may not even exist right now. So if you're going to be, you know, going beyond text and beyond even images, right? Maybe video input, uh, audio, right? There, there are multimodal uh, inputs that these models can take in now. And how do you protect your organization and prepare them that you may not be able to have that zero trust capability um, and kind of, you know, uh, fortress around that, right? Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's that's how fast this is moving that we see, you know, we we've gone from 18 months ago where it just seemed revolutionary that there was a simple, basically ASCII text chat bot that conversed at a high enough level that you felt like it could help you with useful work. That was amazing to now the point where we see these things being able to process video in real time, create um you know, create video, audio, pictures. Um, you know, we, we even see presidential candidates in the last week accusing each other of making fake um, images with AI for their own purposes. And whether that whether any of that's true, it's completely plausible these days because we all know that it's it's capable of it. So the idea that you're, you know, LLM powered robot could be walking down the sidewalk and get a prompt injection by reading a billboard billboard is, is completely plausible at this point. And, um, it's, uh, it does open up a lot, but I think the good news is the basics are the same. And if you do understand the basics of how these models work and a lot of these vulnerabilities, you know, the fact that we can say I'm getting a prompt injection, it's just coming from a video or an audio a lot of the approach that you take doesn't change. Um, it just means, yeah, I have to take that seriously because it could come from a lot of ways. But the idea that it's still a prompt injection and I know how I'm going to attack that, how I'm going to mitigate that and what the defenses should be, those are not any different. So understand the basic principles and as the technology advances, you'll be well positioned. Thank you. I think that's um, definitely a positive note. Uh, um, I know we have a hard stop. And uh, so let's, uh, let me just ask you for any closing comments, you know, that you want to give regarding um, either awareness or possible issues and security risk or the value that we can get out of this innovation if we uh, adopt it responsibly. Yeah. So look, I, I think that large language models, generative AI in general, um, these are not flash in the pan technologies. There's a lot of debate about whether they're overhyped or underhyped. They're real and there's tremendous value there, but with great power comes great responsibility. And that means we have to take these security considerations really seriously. So uh, for everybody out there, if you'd like some more educational material, you can go to genai.owasp.org. That's the easy shortcut to go get to that project that includes the top 10 list, the CISO checklist. We're creating new documents and updating those all the time. And then again, um, new book that I just wrapped up that should be, um, you know, available on Amazon and other uh, platforms in early September. Uh, that is the developer's playbook for large language model security. So please check it out. Yes, absolutely. Um, really important to have a resource such as what Steve's um, put together. Uh, very happy to read that and endorse it and um, uh, promote it. Uh, is there a way that people can get in touch with you, uh, Steve? What's the best way to do that? Hey, reach out to me on uh, on Twitter at Virtual Steve or grab me on LinkedIn. Um, happy to follow up with people. I post a lot around AI related topics, security topics. Love to hear from you more. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.